And just like that, all of a sudden looks like we have ourselves a leadership race. Andrew Scheer announcing Thursday morning that he's stepping down from being party leader after the poor performance in the election, although it wasn't that bad. He did win the popular vote, but still lots of people had the knives out for him and he decided to not stick around and wait until the April leadership review. Instead, he's bowing out sooner, although we'll remain in office as leader, as interim leader, until a new leader is selected. So already we get the roll call of names, possible candidates, possible contenders to replace Andrew Scheer's leader and take the next shot at trying to unseat Justin Trudeau in the next election. And uh, people love sort of the gossip, they love the names, they like, oh, who's interested in this, who's calling that, and so forth. And that's all important because obviously it is about selecting a person, a name to play that role. But I think this time around, we're going to, and we should, be hearing policy discussions happen now more than ever. Sometimes leadership races, kind of shamefully, are actually not really about ideas. They're often uh, just about backroom dealings and horse trading and so forth and, and notions like electability and, and likability, which matter, of course, but still you want to pick someone based on their policies, that their policies are things that you think will advance the nation. And I think we're going to be more policy heavy this time around than we have been in past leadership races, only because Canada is at a crossroads now more than ever. You know, you look back to the 90s and the early 2000s, Jean Chrétien years, Stephen Harper years, and in some sense they kind of had things easy. I mean, yes, we obviously had uh, the conflicts in Iraq and participating in the war in Afghanistan was a big issue. Uh, to manage, but right now we have almost existential threats going on in Canada that we have not seen like this for quite some time, some of them being very new threats. There is a Cold War underway right now between China and the Western world. I, I don't use that phrase lightly, but it's what's happening, and many eminent observers are agreeing, yeah, we're pretty much in a new Cold War right now. Justin Trudeau doesn't want to confront the issue, wants to put his head in the sand for it. Now, there are other people out there, even conservatives, who are still reticent to throw the gauntlet down and say, this is what we must do. This is how uh, we can get our game together and our act on when it comes to resetting the relationship with China. The way that the conservative leadership hopefuls need to do is chart a path forward on this issue. That is an absolute of absolute importance here, dealing with the China file. Climate alarmism is another big file here. There's going to be a lot of pressure put on this cadre of leadership candidates to, to cave on the issue, to learn to love the carbon tax. And you see all these headlines and more liberal publications saying, oh, experts say the next leader must support the carbon tax and that sort of nonsense. And the experts will just be seen to be uh, partisan operatives and you know, political science professors and so forth. But I think that's nonsense. In fact, I think the exact opposite is happening. I think there's a bit of a weakness on the climate alarmist front. They've oversold things, Greta Thunberg, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, they're too over the top and it's creating a bit of a backlash. And I think there's an opening, there's an opportunity right now for more conservative minded people to step forward and say, okay, you care about the environment and these climate issues, free market solutions. Because that's the core thing, the whole point of running for conservative leader, running for prime minister as a conservative, is how will I take my conservative principles and solve the problems of the day. So the issue is how can you take people's concerns about environment and so forth, filter it through the conservative prism? And the answer to that is of course, free market solutions, private sector, all this R&D that's going on in industry to build a better mousetrap to herald the green revolution. It's getting behind that kind of stuff and really pushing that narrative and pushing that part of the conversation which is woefully under discussed. The idea that it must be an authoritarian top-down carbon tax that just increases and doubles and triples every few years. Are you kidding me? I mean that is actually the old news. That is yesterday's thinking and we need to step forward on it. So I hope we hear ideas like that during the leadership race. There's one sort of pet project idea that I want to propose that I'd like to see people talk about a lot more and that is the opioid crisis. Donald Trump is making it a big priority. You don't hear about it a lot in the media, but go to the White House website and, and read up on what they're doing. And, and they care about dealing with this issue. And they're declaring it a nonpartisan issue. They're putting both policing issues on the table, but also funding issue for support programs. Thankfully, we don't have an opioid crisis numerically as bad as they have in the United States, but it's still bad. Over 10 people a day dying uh, from overdoses. It should not be happening. And let's talk about that issue more. Conservatives don't discuss it anymore. 
as much as they should be. The other day, a prominent NDP figure told me that she wanted to see uh, shipments from China, crates over on, on, on the, the west coast there, opened up by Canada border agents to look for illicit fentanyl. I think that's a great idea. We should be hearing calls for that, not just from the NDP, but from the Conservatives as well. A lot of files to lead on here, a lot of important issues that are really front and center in the front pages. It's got to be an ideas-based campaign. And I think the grassroots and the membership and the general public will respond well to that also.